Thank you very much, Mary, for that introduction. And good afternoon to everybody. It's great to see so many familiar faces and uh, hope to get to meet some of you whom I don't know. Um, I want to start with a little story, which I think colours um, the remarks I'm going to make uh, today. Thanks very much. Um, several years ago, uh, when the Ex European External Action Service was being set up in Brussels, I was invited to speak on a panel. And I was presenting the point of view of the Commission, and uh, there was somebody on the uh, panel on representing the Council Secretariat. And because I thought it would be interesting, I'd brought, on, uh, brought along with me a young stagiaire, an intern. And so when it was all over, I said to him, and, and what did you think of it? And he said, it's all about power, isn't it? <laughs> and he was right, it is all about power. And so that's why I'm going to have the theme of um, power woven into what I'm going to say, because um, the five-year change that's just taken place um, is all about who has the power, who wants it, and most importantly, um, for what purpose uh, do people want the power um, at European level? Um, a power play, in some way or other, is most often behind the institutional wrangling that goes on, and it explains why our member states spend so much time in wanting to um, decide who is in power, um, how to shape the institutions, because um, they, they feel that that is a way of uh, exerting their influence at European level. Now, I'm conscious when I say it's all about power, that sounds like some kind of um, you know, West Wing um, series um, of um, a highly um, soap opera version of life. But I think um, when most people hear uh, somebody's going to talk about institutional change at European level, their eyes glaze over and they go, oh, you know. So, um, I, but I think if you look at it from the point of view of where does the power now reside and who's going to be calling the shots, then I think um, it makes it at least, you can stay interested that bit longer, I hope. Um, and Europe itself is all about trying out different power models. And, um, we have always been a continent where some powers are up and some are down. The 20th century for Europe was a devastating um, um, demonstration of the shortcomings of the dominance model of power. Um, and the modern EU is, um, of course, a reaction to that. And it's actually about a model based on power sharing, of designing something that pushes people to find agreement with each other, and that prevents any one strong, dominant person, power, country um, from, from taking control. And before I start to talk about um, all of the, how that's influencing the current um, new leadership of the institutions, um, I want to start by talking a little bit about the background against which these brave men and women um, are now taking up um, the reins of power um, at the moment, and in fact today um, is a very good day to have this uh, particular lecture because Charles Michel is um, starting to chair his first meeting of the uh, European Council. Um, so the, the background, um, the points in the background that I want to mention are the following. First of all, we are all witnessing new power games around the world. Um, the arrival of Donald Trump, the seeming permanence of Vladimir Putin, these are examples of a different kind of power structure, the strong man, the, 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 the leader who must not be questioned, the leader who must be obeyed. This, these are models that the world is experimenting with. Um, we also see um, the reaction of the powerless, or those who, see, who feel they are powerless. So the protests um, in different countries about those who feel left behind, the Gilets Jaunes in France, uh, you see protests everywhere from people who feel the system doesn't represent me, I uh, don't feel represented by those in power, and probably the Brexit referendum was the greatest manifestation of that closest to us that we have seen um, in, in many years. Um, the EU itself is under pressure from outside. There are people who don't like our model and who don't want it to work. And again, uh, people like Putin and, and even Trump don't hide the fact that they don't want the EU to succeed, probably largely because it's the only bloc that's big enough to actually uh, challenge uh, what they want to do and to be um, an obstacle to, to their agendas. Um, and I think the EU is, is perplexing to its population as well because it's atypical. It's not a state, it's not a federal model. 
it's something different and it's something that evolves with each generation um, of, of European citizens and of people who come to power. Um, and of course, um, it, it, it does have its own internal divisions and I'll talk a little bit about them later on. Um, and probably with the departure of the UK and with, I presume, a reduction, at least in focus on Brexit, um, those internal divisions will become more apparent as the EU27 tries to put together a new agenda for what is the EU without the UK and where is it going. And last but not least, um, the digital age makes um, communication much easier. We all are on our iPhones all the time now, but it also makes it much more difficult to um, explain complex issues and to get public buy-in for compromises when the sound bites and the tweets on social media are all at the polarizing extremes of you like it or you don't like it. But in fact, as we all know in our own lives, um, it's usually all about finding compromises with people who we care about or who we want uh, to work with. And so that's a much more difficult model to explain. So that's some of the background against which this brave band of men and women have either wanted these jobs or have agreed to take them on. And uh, I make that distinction because I think it's relevant. So I'm going to just talk briefly about the different institutions and tell you how I see them um, from what I know from the inside and now with um, the distance of four years from uh, not, being, um, not being at today's European Council. Um, so um, the first obvious difference in the Commission is it's the first time we've had a, a woman president. And this will change things. Um, first of all, she has an almost gender balanced college. Um, that has never happened before. Um, and my experience of seeing the Commission level, the commissioners go from having no women around the college table to having two to then having one third um, is that when you reach a critical mass of, of having women around the table, the kind of debate that they have changes and the way that they work together changes. So I think I expect that you will see differences both in style and in substance coming from um, the commission that's led by Ursula von der Leyen. She has already mapped out her, her priorities, a European Green Deal, and she has already delivered the first instalment of that yesterday, uh, an economy that works for people, Europe fit for the digital age, um, protecting or promoting our European way of life, a stronger Europe in the world, and a new push for European democracy. So how is it going to work? Um, first of all, it's important to know, as you all do, that President von der Leyen was not, did not emerge from the Spitzenkandidat process. Um, the idea that um, the uh, European Parliament had a big say in choosing who would be um, the President of the Commission, reflecting the results of the European elections. Um, and that is important. Um, I think it was something of a setback for the Parliament. I think it was the Member States clearly reasserting their stamp and saying the power shift towards the Parliament has gone far enough. We want to reclaim this for ourselves because the President of the European Council uh, chairs us as the Prime Ministers and we want to, to have our say in who, who does that. Um, a second novelty was that the European Council also said uh, as president, she should have two executive vice presidents and told her who they should be. And this has never happened before. Member states nominate their own commissioner, but they've never had a role in nominating other commissioners. And they did this to try and reflect the balance, the power balance in the European Parliament between um, the EPP, the Socialists and the Liberals. Um, now, uh, she has accepted that and she has gone one further. She felt that it was a very West European balance and so she has invited Mr. Dombrovskis to be the third executive vice president in the commission to make sure that everybody understands that she sees the whole of the European Union as um, needing to be represented in the way that the commission works. Um, so, so these compromises that were partly um, part of the terms of her taking office and partly decided by herself um, have given a fairly complicated structure at the political level of the Commission because you will have a president, three executive vice presidents, eight vice presidents. Um, and my, my former colleagues, I think some of them are, are still calculating exactly how many commissioners they will be reporting to. Um, so there's going to be um, work to be done, I think, to get the adherence of the new commissioners to the priorities of the president. Of course, everybody will pay lip service to the fact that they 
they have come to office to deliver these priorities. But trying to get that number of people lined up to deliver um, the priorities is, is quite a challenge. Um, and it will be um, uh, a challenge of, I think, all her, her female collaborative skills to make um, the executive vice presidents, the, the vice presidents, and the few ordinary commissioners who there will be uh, to get them to work together. Um, another salient point um, in her mandate is the fact that in her vote in the parliament um, to become president, she got fewer votes than either President Barroso or President Juncker. So it was a fairly tight um, margin. And um, that um, she also lost three uh, de commissioners designate in the course of the process. And that's why she, one of the reasons why she doesn't, but that is the reason why she doesn't have a, a fully gender balanced commission. Um, so she has had to make commitments to the parliament in order to get elected. She has committed to come with ideas on how to reform the Spitzenkandidat process, so she doesn't accept that it's dead. Um, she will make proposals and then we will see what happens to them. She has also given a commitment, um, which I, I don't see written about much in the press, but which um, worries me from two points of view. Um, the design of the EU is that the Commission has the sole right of initiative to propose legislation. And this is about the checks and balances in the EU as to who does what. The Commission is not a government, it's an executive. But giving it the sole power to propose legislation um, is part of the basic architecture. Um, and it's something that the Parliament um, has not been happy about for quite a while, especially um, since the Parliament is now co-decider on all legislation. And the Parliament feels that um, other parliaments have the right to initiate legislation and it should have it too. So um, the new president of the commission has given a commitment that the commission will make a proposal every time a majority in the parliament votes that the commission should make a proposal. So that is quite a departure from the current way in which the checks and balances operate. Now, that makes me a bit uneasy because there hasn't been a treaty change to decide this. It's a, a compromise. Um, uh, but it make, what worries me most of all is um, it will make it very much more difficult for the Commission to stick to um, a fairly um, concise list of priorities if it's having to respond all the time to um, majority suggestions from the Parliament that it should make legislative proposals that aren't necessarily part of the Commission's priority agenda. And I think that matters because I think in order to convince um, European citizens um, that the Commission isn't some mad machine that's spewing out initiatives all the time. Uh, the Commission does need to be elected on a mandate of a limited number of priorities and then to stick to delivering them. And there's enough, that, more than enough, that needs to be done at European level that can't be done by Member States on their own um, to, to warrant sticking to that um, kind of precise, uh, that concise um, list of priorities. And I don't see much sign that the member states have really woken up to this sort of power shift. Now, cynics will say it's inevitable and that the parliament, um, if it can muster a majority, then it should be listened to. Yes, but should, it, should the commission be automatically obliged to make a legislative proposal? I, I have some doubts myself, I think. Um, so that, that is going to be potentially um, an area of contention between the institutions in the future. Um, I think um, this very complicated landscape and the fact that the Commission um, had um, a, a very small majority in coming into being is going to mean um, yet more uh, increase in de facto powers of the Parliament. And um, we will see that um, uh, as the Commission gets its feet under the desk. Um, and it will have to hit the ground running. As I said, the first instalment of the Green Deal was delivered yesterday. Um, probably the first big challenge for the new commission is going to be deciding the budget for the next seven years. Um, that will be discussed by the Prime Ministers today, but I don't think they will reach agreement. There will be some waffle words, but um, they're, they're not yet geared up and ready to get stuck into the, the horrors of trying to negotiate. Um, but um, this can be an opportunity for the new commission because it has inherited the budget um, proposal from its predecessors. Um, and certainly in order to move the European economy much more decisively onto the path of climate neutrality, um, that will need to be reflected in the budget, otherwise the Commission will not be able to put money behind um, a much greener agenda. So, going to be interesting times. Um, 
I think Ireland has positioned itself fairly well in this debate. We, it's a novelty for us to be a net contributor, um, not necessarily um, one that we like, but it is a sign of our maturity as a member of the European uh, Union. And I think um, uh, being willing to countenance um, an increase in the budget, provided it's for the kind of policies that the future looking policies that we want, um, I think puts Ireland in a pretty good position. But that will be, um, all budget negotiations are horrible. And when you're trying to decide on a multinational, multi um, multi-annual multinational budget, it's particularly difficult. Um, and so I've said a lot about the European Parliament, but now I want to um, come to it. Um, I think um, it was very positive that there was a higher turnout um, in the elections in May, June this year um, than for many, many uh, previous elections. And, and that was partly a Brexit effect, um, partly the rest of Europe waking up to what, what we would lose and could lose if the European Union doesn't, um, doesn't continue. So the high turnout was very positive. But I think in most countries, the elections were on national issues rather than on, on European issues. We are not yet at the stage where we have kind of pan-European topics in our elections. Um, the far right did not um, prevail as much as some pundits had, had predicted, and I think that's a good thing. But as I said already, uh, or maybe I didn't say already, the, the old um, duopoly between the um, European People's Party and the socialists, um, who previously together on their own had a majority, that is now gone. They only have 43% um, of the MEPs. And so um, they will always need um, the Liberals and perhaps the Greens. Um, to, to achieve a majority for any legislation that requires parliamentary decision. That is going to complicate decision making because the more parties you have to bring into a compromise, the more difficult it is to negotiate. It will probably take longer. Um, but it can still be very positive for the centre ground of European policy because those parties, if they come together and agree, will represent um, a, a huge uh, percentage of the European population. So I think it will be harder to get there and slower to get there, but I still think the pro-European centre, um, when the chips are down and there are important decisions to be taken, will still be able to, to carry the day. Um, I was describing um, uh, a moment ago how the European Parliament has um, used its, its clout um, to get further concessions from the Commission. Um, but it didn't get its way on the Spitzenkandidat, as I said, and that has left a sour taste in, in the mouths of some of the, of the European parliamentarians, and that everybody will have to work to try and overcome that and to, um, to make sure that um, there can be a forward-looking agenda and not the backward look of, we didn't get our way, so we're not very happy. Um, I think the... Um, the extremes, there, there are extremists in the European Parliament. There are a lot of populist, nationalistic um, representatives, and I think they will make a lot of noise and get a lot of media attention in the coming five years. But, and they, they will have potential to delay and frustrate um, a progressive uh, agenda. But as I said, I think um, in the end of the day, the majority, there is still a clear majority for uh, central, um, center ground um, proposals. And I think, of course, all of this means for business and for civil society, it's going to be harder to interact and try to influence European policy. Uh, they will have to lobby a lot more people. Um, they will be less sure that if they know the views of X or Y or Z grouping, that that will necessarily carry the day. Um, but that's the way it is, and um, everybody will have to adapt to it and um, learn how to deal with um, uh, a broader range of views and then how to knit together compromises that, uh, that could ultimately um, be carried over the threshold. Turning then to the European Council, um, which is meeting today and um, the first time that there's no British Prime Minister there and the first of the future basically, uh, depending on how the British vote today and how all that goes. So um, a new president at the helm already a Europe of 27 rather than 28 in all likelihood. Um, and I described how I see um, the European Council as having reasserted itself over the choice of its president and uh, that being a clear uh, political message from, from the, the member states. Um, 
the France and Germany will continue to be the dominant uh, member states in the European Council. Um, and what we see at the moment is, um, I think, a strong French desire for a bigger role for the EU and for France on the world stage. Um, uh, and that, um, to some extent, being frustrated by a German reluctance to, to lead. Um, so I think um, there will need to be a lot of discussion about what kind, what kind of agenda does the EU want to follow? Now, there's going to be um, uh, yet another debate on um, the future of Europe. Um, the new president of the Commission has said that she will have one and report on it by next June. France and Germany will be discussing at the European Council today uh, a non-paper they have put forward um, where they want to take two years um, to discuss. And the two years has something to do with the fact that they want... Um, the discussion on what kind of policies the EU should follow to open under German presidency, which is the second half of next year, and to close under French presidency, which is um, the, in early 2022. So you see them already wanting to frame the debate, um, already wanting to um, contribute, of course, but also to determine to, to quite an extent um, how that's going to happen. Um, my own concern is that when, um, at European level, we find it difficult to know what we want to do, we tend to fall back on process. And at the level I'm talking about now, process means treaty change. And I would really hope that we would have learned the lesson that treaty change should be the way of turning into uh, a codification what we have agreed we want to do, but it doesn't usually happen like that. Usually we change the treaty without having agreed what we want to do. So um, maybe here in Ireland we, with our, this, we bear the scars and uh, uh, are, are quite reluctant to have to get into treaty change, but I really hope that the EU 27 of the future will be able to agree on a, on a, a policy path and only then ask whether we can do it under the existing treaty or whether we need uh, to change the treaty because we all know um, how complicated and how fraught that process can be. Um, I think the departure of the UK, I mean, I, you don't need me to spell this out, I think the departure of the UK um, from the European Council is going to be a real loss because the British have consistently been um, one of the big voices for keeping Europe open to the outside world, for international engagement, um, they have been very challenging partners for the other member states quite a lot of the time, but even that process of challenge has um, very often improved the quality of decision making by making people think through a little bit more um, the consequences of decisions. So they, they will be very missed around the table um, and we will, we will just have to, to find ways of dealing with it. Um, it's interesting that the person who takes over as president of the European Council comes from the younger generation. Um, I think Charles Michel, um, from birth, will have been um, uh, imbued with um, the, the whole European ideal and uh, um, lives and breathes it. He understands, as co somebody coming from a small country, just how important uh, EU membership is for helping Belgium, in his case as prime, former Prime Minister, to, to influence and shape its destiny. And so I think that is good for those of us who come from small countries, that we have a president who understands um, the needs of small countries to be respected, to have their views represented around the table. And of course, being Belgian, he is also a past master in the art of the compromise. Um, and that is very necessary around the table as well. So I think he will bring um, his own stamp, his own enthusiasm, but also that background. Um, which will be very useful in the job that he's, that he's just started. Um, he has said that he wants to improve the working methods of the European Council, and I think that certainly would be a good idea. Um, and one of the things he's putting emphasis on already is that he wants to follow up implementation of the decisions they have arrived at. And that's very good, because there is a tendency to spend all night arguing about the words and then to go home the next day and to forget you know, what they've actually decided on, or actually to spend all night agreeing on the wording and then come out and give 28 different press conferences about <laughs> what they have decided. So uh, a bit of improved um, follow-up on implementation would certainly make it more effective. Um, I think that he and the President of the Commission will work very well together. I think they will understand that um, if those two key institutions don't um, find a way to um, move the agenda forward together, it will not move forward. And I think they will come into office understanding that 
bickering between the Commission and the European Council um, is, is in nobody's interest. Um, I think um, one of the big challenges for the, the future is to try to get the heads of state and government in the European Council um, to focus on um, more strategic issues. And the most important immediate one of that is what relationship does the EU actually want to have with the UK uh, beyond just concluding a trade deal? It's very difficult to get them to focus on abstract issues where there isn't a crisis, where there isn't a decision to be taken. But I do think um, if, if the UK does leave at the end of January and if the current government is returned and sticks to the idea of wanting a fairly minimalistic trade agenda, then we will need um, all of the prime ministers to think quite deeply about what kind of relationship do we want uh, to have with the UK and how to go about it. Um, but that is not something that they are traditionally used to um, spending their time on. Um, I also want to make um, a quick um, reference to the ECB. Um, we all saw during the Euro crisis um, how, how vital uh, the ECB is to where Europe goes next. Um, it is, I think, highly advantageous that Christine Lagarde was inside um, most of the European Council discussions on the Euro crisis. She was there as head of the IMF, so she's seen the debate, she's seen the difficulties. Uh, she will have a very good political sense, I think, of what's possible and not possible as a result of that experience. Um, I think she has received a very good legacy from Mario Draghi, um, and I think she's likely to be in, in his end of the spectrum in terms of seeing what the role of, of the ECB should be. So um, will all of these people, um, men and women, um, be able to work together? Um, and um, you have in each of the three institutions that I've mentioned um, one person. In the parliament, it's more complicated because you have a president of the parliament, but he or she is only, he at the moment is only there for two years. So they have a much shorter cycle. And that tends to give a bigger role to the political, um, the leaders of the political parties and the conference of presidents. I think that um, on the big issues, um, because they have to, they will be able to find an understanding and a compromise. But I do think um, the, the, the outcome of the European Parliament elections will not make Europe easier to govern than it has been up to now. And I think in some areas um, in the modern world, and I think about the digital area as an obvious one, uh, we need to make decisions quickly because te technologies change so fast. And if you don't decide quickly, you are a rule taker or a policy taker rather than a policy maker. So I think um, if, if it's going to be slower to get legislation through the parliament, um, that will certainly call into question some of the decision making processes and um, a need to look at how can Europe speed up, how can Europe take decisions faster, while not losing um, the fact that everybody's views have to be represented. So that's going to be a particular challenge, I think. But I would be optimistic um, that the new team um, uh, in all of the institutions um, has a real commitment to Europe succeeding, is seeing the pressure from outside, is seeing the challenge to Europe's values, and, and will be able to work together. So. If I come now to, um, once they um, are all settled in, um, the key challenges that they, they will be facing, and I'm not going to be too long or detailed on these, but just to, to mention them. I think um, there's going to be a lot more focus on the EU's role in the world. That will come from inside the Union, what do we stand for in the face of the kind of challenges I referred to in my opening remarks. Um, our open trade model is under pressure from rising protectionism. That, if, we, if, if that continues to be the case, our model of prosperity will be affected. Um, we also have the issue of defence. Um, what does Europe do by way of external engagement, uh, as well as internal protection against um, the kind of pressures that there are at the moment? So I suppose Europe will be asking itself and trying to find an answer to the question, can we sell our <coughs> soft power model? Um, there are lots of countries around the world that want our soft power model to succeed. Um, because they feel um, better taken into account. But we will, I think, need to step up um, our alliance building and engagement with other parts of the world for that model to work. Um, I think the question of values is always very important. Um, we have 
maybe overdone the lecturing the rest of the world about our values and the need to take our values into account. But I think that's ultimately how the EU defines itself. So I think we need to find a way to um, explain our values, explain how they work for us. Um, and to do that, we're going to have to deal with some of the internal divisions we have over, over values at the moment um, in looking at um, the different attitude of the governments in Poland and Hungary, for example, um, and the fact that the prime ministers have been fairly reluctant to tackle those issues. And I think especially the younger generation um, wants Europe to be more clear about its values and to stand up and defend them. So that's one whole set of issues. And that leads me to the issue of migration, because there's a desperate need for the EU to get its act together on migration and to develop a policy that works. Um, and um, control of our borders, managing our borders, managing um, flows of migration so that we bring in the people we want to, to have in Europe and that we continue to have a, a strongly humanitarian approach to refugees and asylum seekers. All of that will come because, because it is existential for Europe uh, and we will have to accept that it's going to come at a cost and then I go back to the, the future budget um, that will need to be provided for um, to some extent. But if we don't manage to um, have a, a European policy on migration that works, then we will continue to see a rise of racism, a rise of populism. We're even beginning to see flickers of it here in this country, although we are relatively unaffected because we have such small numbers wanting to come. But um, uh, in order to deal with the um, anti-EU, more populist policies across uh, much of the EU, uh, there is a need to, to revisit and define um, a workable migration policy for the future. There is um, the whole green agenda. Climate change um, is very much on everyone's lips now. The question is how to take it into, into the area of action. Um, uh, I don't think we will see a big breakthrough in the European Council this evening. I think we'll see a lot of very carefully balanced wording to reflect the different views around the table. But um, we will not be credible if we don't move to action. And I think the um, uh, new president of the commission is, has put her finger on quite a lot of the right <coughs> issues like a just transition to um, a climate neutral economy. Um, the issue of carbon border taxes, I think, will be potentially very problematic and um, will not make our relationship with the US and others any easier. But um, it is going to come uh, to debate. It's going to be. It is part of the package. So I think we will have to see how do we how do we manage to, to work our way through that. Um, the new leaders will also have to deal with the economic situation. Europe is growing fairly slowly. Uh, that has all kinds of consequences. Um, the reform and stabilisation and consolidation of the euro is not complete. Um, but as soon as the crisis lessons, then the appetite for further, uh, further change in that area has become much weaker. Um, so there too, I think um, there will be a, a highly technical agenda to be worked through, but it's necessary because there will be crises in the future and we need to make sure that we are stronger and better able to deal with them than we were previously. And one of the areas where that will be very relevant is the whole area of social policy. Um, for many, many years, the, Europe, the EU has had much stronger economic policies than social policy. Um, that is part, was partly, not exclusively, but partly due to the UK resistance to any European involvement in, in social policy. So their absence may well, and I think will, um, facilitate um, a push towards um, implementing a social policy um, driven by the need to reassure those parts of the population who feel left behind that they are not going to be left behind and that although the world may not be for them as it always has been, that the European Union does care and will find ways to help them work through the difficulties. And one of the many commitments of President von der Leyen is to pr uh, propose a legal instrument to ensure that every worker has a fair minimum wage. That doesn't mean the same minimum wage across every country, but to have a fair minimum wage. And she's also um, talking about um, proposing a European unemployment benefit reinsurance scheme. Um, and I think that's going to require a rethink um, here among our social partners, particularly the business partners, um, that if there is a stronger uh, social agenda um, uh, emerging at European level, how do we want to shape and influence it? How can we ensure that it's a modern social agenda 
um, that, that uh, takes shape. Um, the digital agenda is also um, very much about power and control. Um, you will all remember that when the GDPR regulation was being worked on and coming into being, everybody thought, oh, this is Europe being too complicated and all the rest of it. Uh, but now we've all realised the value of protecting privacy and data privacy. And if anything, I think probably people feel it didn't go far enough. So um, this is another huge new agenda where we will need to be nimble and be able to decide policies and perhaps take um, decisions fairly quickly. And um, uh, with the new focus that there is on artificial intelligence, uh, President von der Leyen has promised... Um, proposals on the human and ethical dimension of um, artificial intelligence. And I think, again, these are areas where Europe can actually lead the world by thinking about these wider issues that perhaps in other parts of the world don't seem to count um, as important um, uh, until, until lessons to the contrary are learned. Um, but I do think um, we're going to have to get much faster at taking decisions and being able to revisit and move on when decisions become outdated, and the digital area is a, is a primary example of that. Um, and I, I won't mention other um, things. Obviously, the tax issue is uh, very much on the agenda. Um, President von der Leyen um, um, is very clear on her message of fair taxation and is supportive of co-decision co and qualified majority voting on that. Again, that would take a treaty change but um, it's obviously an issue where Ireland is going to be under pressure and we'll have to think about um, what is our policy and, and how strongly do we, do we stick to it. And then last but not least, the future relationship with the UK. Um, it won't only be about a trade deal. And if, if we agree just a quick fix trade deal, there will be hundreds of other issues that will then come up um, in terms of market access, market impact. Um, but there's also the whole um, green agenda, where the UK is much closer to European, to, to, to EU views um, than other international partners. There's the whole question of cooperation on foreign policy, defence, etc. So um, it's going to be with us for quite a long time to come. And I think the EU, as I said, will have to do some deep thinking about where do its real interests lie and what kind of um, relationship is it, does it want and is it willing to offer the UK. So to wrap up, um, I started by saying it's all about power. Um, and I think it is. There, is a, there has been a power shift. Um, the um, Lisbon Treaty bringing the European Council into being as an institution has um, uh, given the member states a much stronger um, influence over the agenda. It has also um, led to the pres presidentialization of the Commission because the President of the Commission is the person who has to interact in the European Council and the European Council meets very frequently. So um, that has been a power shift. Um, I think also the Spitzen candidate process is not dead, but the fact that it failed to um, deliver the result this time round is a bit about a rebalancing of power as seen from the, from the member state side. Um, I think um, it will uh, take time for the new leaders to settle in and to uh, figure out what is the extent of their powers, what are the limits of their powers, and uh, where do they need to work together. Um, I think it's clear that the Commission and the Parliament are much more used to thinking Europe-wide and coming with policies that um, can cover the whole of the Union than the Member States, whose, whose job is to think nationally. So I think um, uh, Charles Michel will have um, his work cut out for him to try to get the European Council to think Europe-wide, to think strategically. Um, and to be uh, able to ensure that those three key institutions will be equally prepared for the debate that is to come. Um, and I think we are, to some extent, at European level, um, we can't define ourselves um, post-Brexit against what um, the UK is losing. We will have to define ourselves against, uh, rather for, what the uh, next generation of the European Union is going to look like and what do we want it to be. Um, and I think we need to have that debate here in Ireland too. Um, we are now at a very mature stage in our uh, EU membership. We are one of the older ones. Um, we've become a net contributor. We are very confident about our place. We've just received enormous, uh, I would say, unprecedented solidarity um, for our position in the whole um, negotiations of the withdrawal agreement. 
Um, and so we will have to think also about what is our willingness to share power at European level and how are we going to equip ourselves having decided where we want to share power, how are we going to equip ourselves um, to, to make a meaningful impact uh, working with others. I think um, the Brexit will continue to be a huge issue here for us, um, but we will also have to think more continental in the future because that's um, what the European Union will be in the future, is much more a continental model of how countries work together. And we will need to um, think deeply, try to bring our population with us, try to make sure our population feels informed um, so that we can contribute to the kind of EU that we all want to live, live in um, for the future. So thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed, Catherine, for that uh, wonderful assessment of the structures and balances and indeed challenges uh, that are facing the EU. Uh, I think, um, as you have outlined there, uh, the very new uh, team that is in place, but also the differences uh, in issues and challenges uh, that face this team compared to, say, the team five years ago. Uh, a completely different set uh, uh, of issues and agendas. Um, Catherine has kindly agreed to take questions on the record, uh, and I would ask anybody uh, who wishes to put a question if you could give your name and the organisation uh, that you're attached to. So the floor is open for questions, and we have a, a microphone going around. John, first question. Um, thank you very much. First of all, uh, compliments on your on your lecture, Catherine. Okay, if my you could question, speak into the microphone. My, 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 my name, first of all, is John Connor. I'm just an humble member of the Institute. Um, my, my question relates to the budget, Catherine. Uh, the budget currently, or in the last, about 40% of it, the largest wedge of it, went to the common agricultural policy. Where do you see that going? I mean, I take it that the, the wedge going to is the CFP is going to go down. More has to go into the environmental policies. And then there's the other issue. The budget is fixed by a small contribution from VAT receipts, if I remember correctly, and that's, of course, hindered by, uh, by lower growth rates in the European community. What chance there is, if there's any, of getting an increase in the budget? Because it is needed if we have all these new initiatives. And finally, Chairperson, I just would like to ask in relation to... Um, Ireland has one of the very crucial commissioners, the Trade Commissioner. I don't know to what extent you wish to comment, uh, but... Um, I'd just like to, you, that you might give us some of your, your own views in relation to what faces Phil Hogan in relation to, first of all, dealing with the United Kingdom, China, of course, and the United States in relation to the trade negotiations. Thank you. Thanks, John. Do you want to take that, Catherine? Yes. Um, without going into too much of the technicalities of the budget, um, I, think, um, I think there is still a prospect of getting a small increase in the budget. Um, and I think um, the biggest helpful factor in that, and it's one of the few occasions where I will say this, is that the UK is not at the negotiating table. They were always the most relentlessly driving the budget down. Um, now, we have very strong resistance from Netherlands, Denmark, uh, but in the end of the day, I think there's a prospect of getting a small increase. I think um, what the, in the current um, multi-annual framework, um, intelligent ways of using the money better has already been found, like the Juncker plan for investing um, and, and supporting investment rather than doing everything through grant funding, for example. Um, and I think also um, opening up the idea that um, when something unexpected happens, member states have to rally around it. That, that the price for member states of having a lower budget is a willingness when something unexpected happens to have to then contribute. Um, but of course, member states, especially those who are in the euro, feel very constrained by the spending limits that they have for their own uh, domestic policy. So it's not an easy one. Um, I think the share of the cap would, will obviously go down if there's a bigger budget in percentage terms, so maybe not in real terms. And I think um, there is already a shift that will probably receive another big push, and that is the greening of the common agriculture policy. So I think it will, the envir environmental dimension of it will be further increased. Um, so um, where does the money for the budget come from? I'm quite pessimistic about that. Um, it should come from own resources, which would free, in, in a 
ideal world. Um, it should come from resources that don't require the member states to stump up every year in this negotiation because then you get into the Margaret Thatcher, I want to get back everything I pay in, I'm not going to pay a penny more than I get back, and I'm not going to count what I get from the single market, I'm just going to count financial transactions. Um, but I see very little chance of that. Mario Monti has done great work on sketching out where um, even partial contributions could come from, but the reality is... Um, I don't remember the exact numbers now, but the share of the budget coming from directly national budgetary transfers has gone up over time, not down. So I think there's almost no hope of that. And I would think one, um, we also, thanks to Maggie Thatcher, we have a very skewed budget um, in which an increasing number of net contributors get money back in a rebate. Um, and this should have been the moment to get rid of the rebates and put the budget on a stronger footing. But I think there will... I would predict there will probably be transitional phasing out of rebates, so there will be rebates continuing in some form or other. So, And we are fighting over a very small amount of money. It's 1% of EU, EU GDP, and it can do a lot because, you know, depending on how you spend it and spending at European level, you can get much more impact from the money than if you spend it nationally. But these are horribly national negotiations. Uh, I think the worst I was ever involved in. <laughs> I don't want to comment on full holding. Well, except to say, I think it is a very important job. Um, I think given um, the current pressures on protectionism and all that, um, I personally think he will be ideal for the job. Um, I saw him when we were still negotiating the transatlantic partnership, and where I think it was the first time for both the EU and the US that we had an equally large and opposite partner, both blocks are used to negotiating with smaller countries and being top dog and um, I think he's well able to defend European interests on that and um, for the UK negotiations I mean who better than an Irishman to understand and to want to find a good outcome for the EU but also for the UK um, now he will um, be operating as part of the wider team with Barnier and all that but again the trade dimension is going to be fundamental so I think it's it's very good to have somebody with his background and understanding and five years' experience already of working at European level in the job. Thank you, Catherine. We have Kevin and also then at the back. Kevin. Um, thank you, Mari. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, Kevin O'Kelly, I'm a member of the Institute. So um, one question on, um, um, on going back to your experience in DG enlargement. Mm -hmm. And the second order will probably be redundant tomorrow. Um, what are your views or what is your reaction to the, um, uh, the French decision to veto the accession um, negotiations uh, with, with uh, the countries of the Balkans? And in fact, the, uh, the whole issue of uh, the extension and enlargement uh, to the Balkan states, which I think uh, has been promised over the years and has been slowly uh, withdrawn. Or the second question could probably be um, uh, redundant tomorrow, but um, Dominic Reeves was here uh, a few weeks ago and I wanted to ask him this question from a UK perspective, uh, but didn't get the chance. On the, the unlikely, and I know Dahi said here yesterday that he's quite sure that Britain will leave within the next month or so, but on the chance that they don't, how do you think the EU27 will react to that sort of situation? In, you know, going back to continuing the EU membership. Okay. Yeah. Um, on the enlargement question, I, I think it's, it's very difficult because it's about which tactic will produce better results. I think, um, I, 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 I absolutely believe that um, we will have enlargement to the Balkans. Um, the question is when and on what terms and it is very difficult that with countries that have struggled for years to get to the opening of negotiations uh, to maintain that drive if they now uh, don't get what they felt was promised to them. On, on the other hand, um, I do think that the population of the EU is more resistant now to um, wider enlargement. Um, given the current experience of Poland, Hungary, Romania to some extent. And it is certainly true that the bar that people have to get over in order to become an EU member state has gone up all the time. 
So uh, I think it's a question of how do you manage to maintain the reform momentum in those countries and maintain the promise, but also make it clear that um, it's not only the economic model that has to change, but it's also the legal, political and cultural model. Because we have seen through experience that you can much more quickly change an economic model than you can change um, the kind of rule of law and separation of powers model. So um, I think France is, is not wrong to send a signal um, that the bar will be much higher and that Europe will not, I, I don't think we will ever have a big bang enlargement again. I think countries will join one by one or yeah, probably one by one and that the impact will be much less um, like when Croatia joined, having missed the boat earlier on when Slovenia joined. But who really noticed apart from Croatia <laughs> Um, that another country had joined. We didn't notice it in the same way as we did in 2004 when 10 countries joined. So um, I think sending the signal that you know it's serious and that you have to change everything and you have to stick with the change is important. But I would just be worried if it demotivates and allows in the forces that might work against. Um, and I think that's the calculation the, the heads of state and government are going to have to revisit. Uh, and on, um, well, if, if, um, if Joe Swinson becomes Prime Minister, which I don't think, um, and the UK was to revoke Article 50, I think there would be, um, I don't know, 48 hours of griping, but Europe would secretly be thrilled. I think, I can see no way that the rest of the EU would not want to keep the UK if there was any chance of it. Now, if we have um, a hung parliament, and um, the Tories and the DUP are back together, and there's any attempt to renegotiate the agreement again, I think there will, will be a lot of resistance. Um, I, I can't really, I don't think it's going to happen, so I, I can't really think my way through it, but I just think um, the EU side has done everything to try to accommodate, uh, to try to understand what is it the UK wants. And I'm not sure that if we have that kind of stalemate outcome by midnight tonight, that we will know any better what it is the UK really wants. Um, so I, I think there would be a lot of puffing and puffing and maybe floundering, but a hardening, a hardening of the attitude on the EU side. You know. But we'll see. I think huffing and puffing is an understatement, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Since Ambassador, it's on the record, I'm yeah, being polite. Gosh, <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Hi, Pierre Emmanuel Dubot, Ambassador of Belgium. Uh, Catherine, thank you for your kind words about the Belgian art of compromise. Uh, I'm an admirer. And then I have a question. Uh, we all of us are familiar with um, members of member states' government sitting for hours in meetings in Brussels, and then when they're in front of the national media or at home, they put the onus or sometimes the blame uh, of the decision on Brussels as a whole, uh, without even mentioning one of the institutions. Do you see anything in the new state of play in Brussels that could help member states to, to have more ownership and take more responsibility for the decisions they take? Um, the eternal optimist in me hopes that there would be because I think one of the lessons of Brexit is if you keep feeding a negative um, line to your population for 40 years, don't be surprised if they end up you know, wanting to damn the whole thing. Um, I, th I think there could be innovations. I mean, I, I have always found it very strange that, as I said, prime ministers can spend all night arguing over the words in a one and a half page communique, and then they come out and say something completely different. If President Charles Michel was able to say, there will be one press conference at the end of the European Council, and I will tell the world what we have decided, uh, and you will agree to go home and to place that before your parliaments and maybe then, you know, when you are home, so after 24 hours, you can put a national touch on it. I think that would really help because then they won't all come out saying, we won, we won, which implies somebody else lost. And I mean, the whole challenge about the whole European agenda is to try to make sure that nobody loses and that everybody, the cake gets bigger, you know, so that everybody wins. But the realist in me thinks that bad habit is a bit too ingrained, and I think it will take longer um, for, for uh, but also I think it will take longer for our prime ministers to become fluent in um, 
presenting the European agenda in a positive light and then adding a national flavour rather than um, the we won, we lost. Um, and, and that would also require a certain shift in the media too. So it's worth, keep, it's worth fighting for and keeping working on, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gavin. Eugene has just there. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Eugene Downs, DFA and member of the Institute. Catherine, uh, you spoke about Europe, both the leadership of the institutions and also the member states, now seeking to equip ourselves with more effective tools and decision-making methodologies mm -hmm. uh, to assert Europe's role as a geopolitical actor and to, to assert greater strategic autonomy. So in this context, what's your own view now of where Ireland's larger interests lie uh, in this vexed question of a uh, potential shift to qualified majority or super qualified majority voting in CFSP. Thanks. Um, I, I uh, sat in on a very interesting debate between uh, former German diplomats on this about a year ago. And one of the people who was participating in the debate was Joschka Fischer, the former foreign minister. And um, some of the former diplomats were saying, well, Germany should take the lead and we should move to qualified majority voting. We should propose it and support it. And Joschka Fischer just said, and about Israel? So um, everybody has something that makes them think maybe they should keep the unanimity, but Europe will not be effective. And I think certainly Ireland should be willing to, to move uh, to qualified majority on that. I don't see huge difficulties, except if it was felt that if we move there, then we'd have to move on tax as well. I mean, I think that's the contamination effect people would see. But if you take it purely on its merits, um, if you want Europe to be effective, we have to be able to respond quickly to world events um, and not wait until the last agreement has come in, you know, because we're always behind then. We're always, we look like we're foot dragging. We're not an actor. We're a, a passive responder. But I can see that it will require a lot of thought because of perhaps the crossover effect. Thank you, Catherine. French Ambassador France. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, a quick question on defence. Mm -hmm. You know that my government is uh, very keen to, uh, to put that on at, at the priority, as a priority in, in the EU. Um, there's talk, unfortunately, of the European Defence Fund getting less uh, money than we hoped. We hoped to get 13 billion and now there's uh, talk of 6 billion. Where do you see the, the debate on defence going in the, in the EU in the coming months? Um, well, I think we need to have the debate about what are we defending? Um, and I think we need, certainly here, um, I think we would have to have that debate about why should Europe have a more active defence policy? I think, of course, if you or up in Lithuania, or if you were in Greece or something, you have a different debate and people see different reasons why Europe has to have a capacity to defend itself and not only defend itself, but perhaps have a defense capability as part of its foreign policy. But I think there is a need for a debate. Um, I think um, there is um, a more modern agenda to defense. And I think a lot of people are seeing the spillover effects between the digital economy and the defense economy. So, and I think that's the kind of slow and cautious way in which a lot of European countries are moving towards more defense spending. So um, I think it, in European um, terms, it's always important to make a start, even if the start is smaller than some might hope. But once you make a start, it's possible to build on it. But I think in, not in all countries, but in quite a few member states, it will be necessary to have a debate and for that debate uh, to, to have public buy-in. And I think the, if we do have a two-year conference on the future of Europe, that is one vehicle where it could be debated and should be debated in a, in a way that, that leads people to revisit their views or to think differently about it rather than um, suddenly having decisions come from the European level. I think there needs to be a lot of buy-in on the ground as well. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, John McGrain. Uh, I think thank I you very might, much, uh, unless chair. somebody is very 
uh, has a really urgent pressing question. I think we'll have to make John Thank you, Mary. the last one. Uh, Catherine, I'm John McGrain from the British Irish Chamber of Commerce and a member of the uh, Institute's uh, UK Working Group. Uh, you're about to add yet another really important string to your considerable bow when you take on the chair of the Citizens' Assembly on Diversity. Would you comment on what you hope to bring to that personally as chair and what you hope to see as the ultimate impact of that very important grouping? Um, well, it's not about my views. It's going to, I, am, I am the hundredth of the 99 others who will be c making up the assembly. So I see my role as try, uh, we have an Oireachtas resolution that gives us the topics to be discussed. And I see my role as shaping the, the structure of the assembly, um, trying to bring in um, the necessary objective expertise. I think it's a real opportunity for Ireland to look at where are we now um, in terms of gender equality. Um, we have come a long way, uh, so I see the main focus as being uh, what are the next obstacles that uh, we as a country should tackle if we want to live in a more gender equal society. Um, and we will, um, I think, make a distinction between um, objective presentations of what is modern Ireland, and there's lots of interesting figures about family composition, um, the numbers of women and men in different areas. Um, it, will be, it is very important to us to bring um, men's voices and men's organisations into the equation because you won't have gender equality without women and men buying in. Um, but I'm very careful um, that we, are, we want to provide information. We will, um, where there are opponents of different views, try to ensure all voices are heard, but then to make enough time for the citizens having been, been informed um, and maybe getting some kickoff questions, then to sit in round tables and try to work out um, what do they see as being the kind of future Ireland they want to live in and what are the key questions, because the purpose is to go back to the Oireachtas with recommendations that could then be taken up either in constitutional change, legal change, or policy change. And I would hope, um, if it's like the previous Citizens' Assembly, that there's a lot of media interest. It won't be quite at the same level of intensity, I don't think, but I hope there would be media interest so that it would get the country talking as well. Because um, what we saw in the last Citizens' Assemblies was that uh, if you inform people and if you give them time to discuss, they come out rather ahead of where the conventional wisdom is on thinking on certain things. Um, and it would be interesting um, just to, to show people um, where modern Ireland is, what is modern Ireland, and then to look at what are the obstacles to continuing on the path that we seem to be on of, of certainly wanting greater gender equality. So I find the process fascinating, and I will be very interested to see where we come out, but I have a pain in my head from trying to think how to turn the Oireachtas resolution into bite-sized sessions of 100 citizens sitting down to discuss it. So it's going to be a very interesting journey. And we wish you well in that. I think the whole process, Catherine, of Citizens' Assembly has received a lot of um, uh, admiration abroad. Yeah, and uh, we read, I think, as the uh, Brexit, uh, in the aftermath of the Brexit referendum, um, uh, a regret that there had not mm. been something similar in the UK. Catherine, we want to thank you most sincerely. I think you have given us a background uh, which will allow us to judge as the uh, events go forward in, in the EU uh, on the basis of what we've heard today. I think we have a much better knowledge and we're much better informed. Uh, and thank you so much. I forgot to say that Catherine also helps this institute to a great extent by being a member of the board and a member of the Future of the EU 27. Um, if I could draw attention to uh, a couple of publications, um, the colleagues in the research department produce every week on the website a bulletin of EU events uh, that are happening uh, in, the, in the Commission and the Council and the Parliament. And yesterday, Dahi and the colleagues uh, in the um, British Irish Group launched a Brexit status report, which is uh, for 2016, 2019 and beyond and the and beyond should attract great attention. So thank you most thank sincerely, you. Catherine, for sharing your knowledge. Thank you.